Good afternoon, folks. Welcome. Uh, as you just told that in 2011, I wrote a book called The Price You Pay. It was a sort of a crime thriller. Sold a few thousand copies as books should do. And uh, then when I was told recently that I should interview, moderate a session with Richard Osman, I thought, yeah, of course, uh, one crime writer to another, that's the story right here. Yeah? And then I found out that his book, his first book, was the fastest selling adult crime thriller on record, right? I panicked. I'm like, no, I don't want to do this. My wife, who is a bit of an optimist, said, look, between you two, you've sold several million copies. <laughs> so, well done, Richard. Us, well done, us. <laughs> so, you are a celebrity TV presenter, producer. You've done the wonderful quiz show. And one morning, you decided to write best-selling crime novels. So, what are you on? What's going on here? Yeah, it's a hello, Jaipur, by the way. Thank you for laying on some rain this morning and making me feel at home. <laughs> it's very, very kind of you. Um, yeah, well, I, I, I sort of, I've been a TV presenter, but that was accidental. I started out as a writer. So I've always written uh, for television. And more importantly, I've always read. So I've always, and I've always read crime fiction. That's always been my favorite. And my whole life, as lots of people here are novelists or, or writing something now, my whole life I was thinking, at some point I'm going to write a novel. But every time I started, I just thought, this is really difficult. I mean, it's so hard to write a novel. Yeah, it took 13 years for yeah. me. <laughs> Look yeah. at you. Do you know what? It shouldn't be that hard. <laughs> That's true. Too. I mean, come on, five, maybe five. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> and then I, I got to a stage in my life where I thought, I do have a tiny bit more time on my hands now, and I, 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 could, uh, you know, I, I, I could spend more time in it. And I had the idea for the Thursday Murder Club as well. And sat down, started writing, and yeah, as it, as it, it's sort of like a runaway train, which, uh, which is yet to stop. And now I find myself in lovely Jaipur talking about it. Yeah, welcome, welcome. Uh, so, you know, the, one of the, the things which is immediately stands out about this uh, series, The Thursday Murder, Murder Club, is that it has this very old world English charm, a mm. uh, lot of humor, laced with really horrendous crime, you know, <laughs> coke drops in, murders happen. Yeah. Um, you might not like the anal analogy which I had. I, I felt like it was P.G. Woodhouse and Agatha Christie got together and wrote a book. You might not... You I know. love that. Oh, right, right. No, that's okay. what I was, okay. <laughs> my two favorite authors, P.G. Woodhouse and Agatha Christie. Fantastic. Yeah, I'll take that. Was, when you started to think about this book, uh, let's say, uh, let me think about this as a book. If I think about it as a series, it gets too much in my head. When you started thinking about you wanna, it... You want to be in my head. <laughs> yeah, I would love yeah. to. <laughs> really, I would love that. But um, was humor a, pri a prime element that you were thinking of? Do you know what? It, it wasn't. It was the opposite, really. Because, as I say, I, lo I love reading crime fiction. But the one thing, I always think crime fiction and humor don't really mix all that well. Because sometimes, like a joke will take you out of the story a little bit. Um, and so, honestly, from the first day I started writing, the only note I gave myself was, don't make it funny. Make it you a thriller. You failed miserably. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but as I, as I developed these four characters, Joyce and Elizabeth and Ron and Ibrahim, they were so funny. And so they did the jokes for me. So as a writer, I wasn't having to do any jokes at all. All I've got to do is send a man with a gun into Joyce's flat and then... Joyce makes me laugh. So, yeah, I was trying not to make it funny, but I, I've always written comedy. And I think the key to any book is characters. And I had these characters who were at an age in life where the way they looked at the world was funny, where they had fewer consequences to the things that they did, where they're very sure of themselves, and the four of them are very different to each other. Comedy naturally happens. What, what it, whatever the crime is, whatever murder has just committed, one of them will say something that makes me laugh. I mean, you're talking about Joyce, so let's uh, start with Joyce as a character. I mean, she's the one who notes everything down. She's a diarist in mm. a sense. Uh, was Dr. Watson or somebody similar ever an inspiration for Joyce? It's a good question, Mike, because th this whole series of books comes from where my mum lives. My mum lives in a retirement community. 
um, just south of London, so in the, in the, in, in the south of England. And my mum was an infant school teacher, so she's used to controlling unruly classes of four-year-olds. And she found herself in this community where there were lots of people who had run businesses or they were judges, they'd done these extraordinary things in life, and all of them had very strong opinions about everything. Every time there was a meeting, there'd be four or five men and women standing up, shouting this or the other. And my mum, because she was an infant school teacher, would wait for them all to tire themselves out. And at the end, she said, I tell you what, why don't we do this instead? And it was always something that served her purposes. And that's what I thought with Joyce. Joyce was a former nurse. And so she's, she's used to getting things done. She's used to having to deal with doctors and consultants and actually doing the hard work herself. And so that's what I wanted as that character, someone who sort of saw everything, but always had a, had, had a solution to things. So she sort of based on my mum in some ways. Fantastic. And so this is a very idyllic community in Kent. Mm. And the contrast is this chilling crimes which happen around them. So was this a deliberate ploy kind of to get these two different settings in? Yeah, I think so. I, I, I think the, the whole idea from the Thursday Murder Club came really when I went to that community. And it's really, it's very beautiful. There's trees everywhere. There's lakes. You can hear the birds singing in the sky. It's very English, very, very pastoral. And, and I would go down there. And because I'm an Agatha Christie fan, I would think, this would be the perfect place for a murder. That's what I'd always think, because, you know, as soon as... Yeah, in every Agatha time Christie, I see beauty, that's what I yeah, think. But <laughs> you, do, you do if you're English, because we're used to Christie. Every time you see a church, you think, oh, I bet that vicar's about to be poisoned. That's what, that's what we grow up on. And so I wanted that landscape to be a character and to feel very genteel and to feel like somewhere you'd like to go and visit. But then, honestly, the truth is, everybody likes a murder. You know, everybody loves it. Everybody, as long as it's not us. Yeah. As long as it, we're not being murdered or murdering. We all, we all love a murder, don't we? I like I get a round of applause for saying we don't want to be murdered. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's an easy crowd. Do you know what? He's right. We don't. Yeah, he is right. No, but, okay, let's, uh, let's think about this. What, so many Scandi Noirs, mur mm. you know, murder, misses, always on the best-selling list. What is it about... And the larger idea about this murder stories which fascinates us. It's first, I mean, my, my grandfather was a police officer for many, many, many years. And he would always tell me stories of people he'd arrested. And we'd walk around the streets of Brighton. He'd point to a house and go, that's a drug den. And I would always be thrilled. We all know there's an invisible world out there, right? We all know we walk past people every day who are making millions or billions doing something illegal and doing bad things. But... We never, we never know them. They never come up and talk to us about it, obviously, because otherwise they'd be in prison. Uh, and so I think people love pulling back that curtain and imagining just the people in their streets who are doing terrible, terrible things. And then we can go about the rest of our day. We can go to the shops with our appetite for murder sated. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, all looks, done. Looks, Somebody looks, else does it and we read He looks like it. a man whose appetite for murder is not sated. <laughs> You know, when I was doing my research, I mean, you are kind of this celebrity presenter, you're always on television, but when I started doing my research and found out how successful you are, I had this notion that you are thinking of yourself and you're giving yourself a retirement occupation, uh, writing out these murder stories and then deciding, okay, this is what I'll do when I, if you ever retire. I thought you were about to say, I thought I was going to murder you. So thank you for not saying that. No, it's How did you... You're not into mind reading. That's one <laughs> thing you don't do very well. No, it's, it, it's definitely that. I've had, a lot, I've had a career in television, really, and that's a very particular industry and a very, very fast-moving industry and a very... There's an immediate impact with television. You get in there, you do it, it's, you know, and then you get on to your next one. And I definitely got to a stage in life where I thought... I I love writing, I love creating, I love, I love doing things for an audience, and I want to do something that represents me a bit more and represents what's in here and what's in here a little bit more. Um, and I think if I'd written a book in my 20s, I wouldn't have had anything to say. So it might have been funny, but there would be no, you know, there'd be no kind of understanding of the human condition. And I think I'd sort of got to the stage in life where I thought, well, maybe, I can, maybe I've got something to add here. And so writing 
for me, I'm hoping, yeah, this is, takes me to 80 or 90. So, I mean, you're an audiovisual person as much as you are writing books, um, and there's already rumors about a big film around this. Yeah. And Steven Spielberg's production yeah. company has brought it. You want to tell us something about it? Yeah, they're, it's, it, they're, they're filming this summer. They're filming the Thursday Murder Club movie. Spielberg is producing. Yeah. Oh, listen, we all know it's going to be disappointing. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Let's not kid ourselves. Uh, and we had, I'm not, I'm not allowed to say anyone who's in it, but we, we I had a conversation with the director last week, and there's some, the great names in it, really, really fa fantastic names, mainly uh, the British and Irish actors. But I think people are going to be happy with the people who are cast as the four members of the Thursday Murder Club. Um, and I can't, yeah, I can't wait to go down and see a bit of are filming. You, are, and are you writing the script? Does? No, I'm going, no, because I, I, I think I'm, it's better that I spend time writing the next book. I always think that sort of feels more appropriate and and writing films is really difficult as well I've, I've literally only just got the hang of writing books i don't i don't want to start doing something else but it's 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 it's, a, it's an amazing thing and it's going to be amazing to see those characters come to life in a different way because in my head people always say well what do they look like i, sort of think, I don't really i don't really know i know what they feel like and i know how they think but in terms of what they look like, I mean, it's um, your guess is as good as mine. Elizabeth, for example, might look like a very well-known British actress who you'll all have heard of, uh, whose, whose name I couldn't possibly mention. Really? But yeah, yeah, yeah. Try. No, I couldn't. I couldn't. But uh, it's a name. People, when I walk down the street, people shout the names of actors and actresses at me in the street as to who, who they want to be in the film. And certainly, uh, certainly, yeah, the, the woman playing Elizabeth is, is a name I get shouted at me in the street a lot. Can't wait. I often wonder what on earth people <laughs> who are walking past think if they don't know me. People just shouting names of actors at me in the street. There are very few who don't know you in, uh, in England, at least. Uh, Richard, uh, when I asked Richard if he would do a bit of a reading, and he said no, he doesn't like to do that. But may I then ask you, for anyone here that might be who hasn't read the Thursday Murder Club Mysteries. Would you want to talk about four characters, your inspirations for them, and just set the setting yeah, out a bit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, they're a gang, the Thursday Murder Club. That's the joy of it. And the one thing, when I would go down to my mum's retirement village, the extraordinary thing, quite apart from the, the, you know, the beauty of the place, is you'd start talking to people, and they'd done such amazing things with their lives, and yet they got to a stage in their life where they'd become slightly invisible and overlooked and underestimated, despite everything they had done, despite doing stuff that I could never dream of doing. Uh, and so I thought, do you know what, if there was a murder here, I bet you lot would solve it. That was the kind of light bulb moment that started the Thursday Murder Club. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna put together a gang, because I love, I love uh, gangs. I want two working class characters, I want two middle class characters, because in these communities, you, do, you sort of meet people you wouldn't necessarily have met during your own career. Um, and so I've got a spy, that's Elizabeth, she was a former spy. She's not supposed to talk about it, but she does endlessly. Because um, she's got to the stage where, who cares if she breaks the Official Secrets Act? What are, what are they going to do to her? She said, there's too much admin putting me in prison. So you know, you know it's going to be okay. So I've got her, I've got Joyce, the nurse. Um, I've got Ibrahim, who was a psychiatrist, and who likes to look very, very logically and you know, left-brained at absolutely everything, and he keeps laminated sheets of clues everywhere. And then I've got Ron, who was a labor activist, who is incredibly... Um, hard-nosed. Hard-nosed is exactly right. And so the four of them come from very different places. And originally, they, they sort of sit around and look over old unsolved police cases. And then a real murder happens. At the start of the Thursday Murder Club, the first book, a real murder happens, and the four of them team together. So that's the principle. And again, as, as, as a TV guy, I thought, that feels like if I get this right, I could keep this gang together for a long time. It feels like I wouldn't just write one book and then think, oh, no, I have to think of another book. It felt like I had characters who would interact with each other for, for, for years to come. And um, my view is of crime fiction, and it's, it's a slightly unfashionable one, that the plots are not the most important thing. I always think characters are the most important thing. I, was, I, I, never, I, I always think it's not what happens in a book, it's why do I care what happens in a book is the question to ask. And so that, that's, what I've, that's the joy I have with these four amazing characters at the heart of it, 
is I just get to spend time with them. And then I bring people in around them, all of whom are initially suspicious of them. And one by one, they pick them off and bring them into the gang. And suddenly the gang kind of snowballs and you've got cops in there and you've got, to, there's a former KGB agent is one of the, you know, so there's, they've got this little satellite of friends who, who help them out as well. But it's, yeah, character is the, character is the key. I mean, you say that um, you feel that you have a long innings with them, but they they are getting older. How how will that pan out? You know. Oh, you know what he's asking there, don't you? How dare you? <laughs> this is these books are a celebration of old age. Come on. No, no, I didn't say. <laughs> no, <laughs> listen, listen. Don't don't think my publishers haven't asked the same thing. It's uh, I try and the first four books all take place over the course of a year. So, you know, I'm getting quite a lot out of each year of their lives. Um, so I'm, I'm foreshortening a lot of what they do. And by and large, the books start the day after the previous book ends. And so I'm, 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 I'm giving them plenty of time right. to... Uh, the problem is when you have to um, cast the movie. So with a film, so my characters are all around about 80, a little bit under, a little bit older. But if you cast... And as I say, I can do four books in four years and they've only aged, you know, a year. But when you do a movie, you film one, and then when you do the follow-up, it's probably three years later, and then maybe it's three years after that. So if you cast an actor who was 80, by the time you got to the fourth movie, they're like 92. It's like the last Harry Potter films, <laughs> when they're all essentially grown adults. And, you know, Harry's talking like that. Uh, so you have to cast slightly younger in the film yeah. in order to... But, but in the books, I can, I can sort of age them artificially slowly, I think, because I, 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 yeah. I want to keep writing them for a long time. And I'm not going to kill any of them. You mustn't, I'm, you mustn't. You, yeah. can't, you can't drive a car with three wheels, right? No, 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 yeah. no way. Um, but, so here is this uh, kind of question which I was getting at, that do you use real-life crimes for your research, or does it just come out of your head, you know, when you drop a huge cache of cocaine, uh, somewhere near their community. Yeah, I think I, I think that. I mean, I'm I'm always reading about crime, and you know, the, I'm writing a new book at the moment. And it was I, d I read an article about something that happened in Dubai, which I found really really interesting. And so I just took the very germ of that, and then I I weave my own world around it. But yeah, I I, I love sort of you know in the in the Last Devil to Die, the bad guys. Uh, they work on a big industrial estate and there's all these sort of hangers. You see them everywhere in the British countryside, these big sort of rusting hangers with kind of signs on it. And they're all full of criminals. I mean, every single, in, in the one in The Last Devil to Die, every single business there, apart from one, a sparkling wine company, every single other business is a criminal enterprise. Uh, and yeah, I love to read about crime and the underbelly of the world and just pick up on little things. So I wouldn't steal uh, sort of particular ideas. But I like to know that world exists, and I think, well, if my gang were to get involved in that world, what would happen? In the, in the new book, there's lots about the antique trade. Uh, and the antique trade, I don't know what it's like over here, but in the UK, it's not always the most legal profession of all, because they're selling objects for cash without really anyone else knowing where they got the objects from. And so there's always been a, a hive of criminality. You, th you think that happens in Britain a lot? The antiques being yeah. taken out? <laughs> oh my God, yeah. <laughs> Listen, I'm absolutely certain there are one or two genuine antique dealers out there. But it's, uh, it's no more than that. There's a, there's, there's a guy uh, in the UK called Raj Bizram, who is an antiques expert on television. And me and my wife did a, did a show with him. And I, I, I was thinking about this antiques thing and some of the crimes, in my view, that get committed in antique shops. Uh, and I said, Raj, here's, can I run a few ideas past you? Tell me if these would happen. And I told him my ideas. And he goes, oh my God, it would be much worse. Much, much, much worse. And so it's, uh, I've, I've, I felt, okay, you know, art forgery and all sorts of things. It's a, it's a booming industry. Look forward to that. Yeah, it's a good thing to get into. Any youngsters here looking for a trade? For, forging art is what is what I would do. Yeah, and get a British passport; it helps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other side of it: uh, Do you also work with uh, police procedures, criminal investigation? Are you kind of uh, do you, do your research on that? Is that? I don't really. I'm not. I'm not a big 
research guy, really. If I'm writing, I like to be writing. I like to be inventing. And I like, you know, I don't like to... I'm not someone who'll stop for an hour and, you know, look up some old, you know, law from 1937. Occasionally, I'll look up train timetables because I know that Joyce would be very particular. And occasionally, I'll look up recipes for lemon drizzle cake because, again, I don't want to get that wrong. But uh, I don't tend to research, and, and I, I was fortunate enough to interview Stephen King, and he said, uh, he said, oh, I don't do any research. And from that moment on, I thought, oh, great. Yes. Now I don't have to. You know, if it's good enough for Stephen King, it's good enough for me. I like to just invent. I like to imagine what might happen. You don't want to get stuff wrong, but, you know, there's people who sort of pick up on tiny little errors. If you, if you do something that's obviously wrong, there's a proof editor who will kind of pick you up on it. But, no, I like to, I like to use my imagination, really. Um, there is um, one of the fascinating things about your books and even Agatha Christie uh, and P.G. Woodhouse, while they're hugely located in a particular place and there is this smell and um, feeling of that place, it's also very universal. Can you talk about the mystery of how you make this so, you know, that all of us here, uh, you know, many who haven't been to England um, haven't enjoyed its idyllic, yeah. countryside. Oh, you Love must come. So I mean, be very careful if you come, but you must come. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll give you the visa sponsorship. sponsorship yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, happy to do that. Um, yeah, it's, do you know what? When I wrote it, it's, very, it's, it's, it's a very British book, yeah. and I can't help it. I thought, you know what? I'm cripplingly British. Always has been. I mean, I'm just, I'm so, my whole family were born and lived within about five miles for hundreds of years just in the south of England. No one moved anywhere or did anything. So I'm, I'm very British. And I did think, well, I can see why British people would like it. And then when it started, it was number one in America, in Brazil, um, you know, so all of these countries and, and, and you know, India it does well. And I, and I, couldn't under, I couldn't really understand it. But then I thought, if I read Indian books, when I read Indian novels, I want them to be authentically Indian. I want to learn about India. I want to learn about daily lives in India. I want, I want them to, be, to feel real to me. And so I think that if you want to read a book that's really, really English, then Thursday Murder Club is. It's, just, it's, it's, a, it's a very accurate reflection of a, of, of a sensibility and, and a way of life. And so I think that's why, firstly, I think people around the world like the fact it's very English, which took me by surprise. But secondly, there's a universality which is in every single culture, it turns out, people, when they reach 70 or 80, begin to feel overlooked and discriminated against and invisible. It's, it's an incredibly prevalent thing in every culture around the world. And so it, there's every place you go to, they kind of go, oh, we're, yeah, we feel like that as well. And isn't that, I mean, it's in one way very, very sad, but in one way fascinating that in every, you know, in every culture, there's this thing where there's an invisibility barrier. Uh, should we let in a few audience questions as we yeah, go along? Yeah, come on, yeah? let's do it. We, I mean, I can see the hands going up, even and the smiles. B, there you go. You're the first one. Yep, hands up with that lady here. She paid me to do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? All right, the microphone is going to come down there soon enough. Is there somebody there? There's a lot of jeopardy now. Yeah. Oh, well. This would be a good place for a murder, by the way. Yeah, no, we were thinking Forgetting about English it. Forget English This would know, be... A Thursday murder club on a at, Sunday afternoon. At the Jaipur Literary <laughs> the Festival. Jaipur yeah. <laughs> Sanjoy is already scared. <laughs> yeah. Someone murders Woody Dalrymple. And, 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 and you have he to... Si he signed the document, and, and, you, and you have to investigate. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll brainstorm. B, go ahead. I'm not quite sure how to follow that up. Um, can I ask about, yeah, you just mentioned the, the essential Englishness of your writing, and the, the gang is comprised of two working class and two middle class uh, gangsters. Can you reflect on that class division in, in English society? Yeah, I mean, you know, in India, of course, there's a, there's a, there's a, a very particular relationship with class, and, and, and so does England. And, you know, in England, you only have to say one sentence and everyone can tell exactly where you grew up, exactly where you went to school, you know, exactly what sort of, how much money you've got, all of that kind of stuff. And I find it fascinating. I come from a big working class family. 
and I find myself now in a very middle class world. So I sort of feel like I can float between those two worlds. And I love, I love having two working class characters and two middle class characters. I feel I can write both of those classes and I feel I can write the differences between them. Mm. But that's where so much of the humor comes from as well, is mm. people's different expectations in life. And Joyce, who's so incredibly competent in everything she does, would never, ever have been able to do the career, had the career that Elizabeth had. Yes, yeah. And their friendship, I, I, find, I was going to say I find it very moving, but I wrote it. But you know what I mean? I find it, it's, to me, it's, it's very, very important that these two women who were born at the same time into very different circumstances had very, very different chances in life and therefore their paths diverged can come together and find their similarities rather than their differences. And, you know, that's... So I don't, I don't want to gloss over class differences and I don't want to gloss over the fact that people have fewer opportunities. Quite the opposite. I want to show it up. But also, I want to say there comes a point where we can all just understand that wherever we were born, we have a fellow feeling. So, yeah, really, really important for the humour and really, really important for the heart of the book, I think, the, the, the class divide. Richard, just to push B's point a little bit, um, it's a very affluent... Yeah. community. So uh, was that to bring out something uh, in your book? Uh, Do you know what? It, it was, for it to be real, those communities exist in the UK at first in a very affluent place, now slightly more middle class, but I think it's the way that we should grow older. And I think that loneliness is such a huge problem in the, in, in, in the UK. And actually living with other people, living in a community is incredibly important. I saw it from my mum. It gave her an incredible new lease of life that suddenly she's around all these new people. She's around people who are much posher and richer than her, so people she hadn't dealt with before, but people she liked. She can walk out and meet people. She can shut the door. So what I want to do is write a book where everyone can agree that this is quite a good way to have an old age. And if you agree on that, then money starts going into that sector, and suddenly this starts becoming much more affordable and much more, you know, and suddenly there's more and more and more of them. And however you want to build them, just the idea that as older people, if we want to, we can live in a community. And so I had to write it to make it true. So it's set in a slightly upmarket place. But I think the lesson of it, which is we, are, we can keep making new friends and having new adventures later in life. I think that's something I'd like to seep into the culture. I mean, I didn't think of this before. Uh, I mean, old age is a huge problem in England and we're yeah. having a lot of conversations around it. Was this therefore a conscious choice to think through that how you might imagine old age to be more um, productive, respectable? Was, was this part of your thinking? Do you know what? I, I, I'd love to say it, it was the spark that lit it, but it wasn't. But it was like, like the Big Bang. I had the idea, and within 0.0001 seconds, I thought, this is great. I get to write about the older generation, and I get to write about what I've just seen of these people who, who have, could be so useful, but we, they're all locked away, and they're, all, they're, they're seen as a nuisance, and people don't really want them to vote, and all of that kind of stuff. And I, So I very quickly thought, I can write a truth here that feels like it hasn't been written enough about a, a generation who, who, who we're ignoring and shouldn't be ignoring. And it's around the world that's resonated in, yeah. And listen, I have news for you all. We're all gonna get older. Like, every, like tomorrow you're gonna wake up older than you are today. So it's in all of our interest to make sure that older people are respected because uh, that's where we're headed. <laughs> that's good. I like to get applause for the selfish <laughs> yeah. bit, which is, yeah. Um, okay, yeah. Uh. Richard, uh, one question is about the writing process, right? Like, once you start the book, do you continue that and complete it, or how, how do you take that? Because I started writing something and I gave a break. Now it's very tough to get back to it. So what is your writing process like? Yeah, it's, 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 it's really hard. It's like, it's like going to the gym. I always think it's like going to the gym, which is, it's horrible to do, but it's lovely to have done. Like walking home from the gym is one of the great walks in the world. And walking downstairs from my study, having done a few hours work is the best thing. Yeah, with the first book, with the Thursday Murder Club, because I wrote the whole thing without telling anyone I was doing it, and I, just, I wanted to finish the whole book before anyone looked at it. I put it down so many times. It's about two and a half years, and I kept looking at it and going, this is terrible. And I kept looking at it and thinking, this do doesn't read like anyone else's book, so no one's going to be interested. But that voice you know that voice because that voice talks to you your whole life and <laughs> tells you terrible things about yourself. And the only job is to 
have a conversation with that voice, tell it to shut up every now and again, and sit down and do the work. And I, I, I try and I only write two hours a day, but if you've got half an hour a day or an hour a day or two hours a day, I, you, you just have to have that discipline. And the key to the discipline is your brain will tell you all the way through that your book is terrible. And by the way, if your brain is telling you that your book is great, stop writing. It's, <laughs> it's not great. We don't want to read that book. So it's good news that, that, that you're putting it away. But yeah, just, you know, sit back down again, you know, just day after day. And, you know, and don't panic when you put it away for a month. You, you always can go back. Look, I'm a better person to answer than, than Richard. I took 13 years, so it will get done. It just takes its time, really. Yeah. That's the one question I can answer better than him. <laughs> uh, thank you. And a half years, yeah. When's, when, when's your next one, Jude? <laughs> you'll be, you'll be 70. You'll be 70. Yeah. You'll be a detective. We'll be, we'll be in a home together at that point. <laughs> thank yes, you. please. Thank you for that. So, um, in the traditional detective story, the sort of st uh, structure is usually a clue puzzle structure yeah. and those clues lead up to a kind of satisfactory closure or resolution. Um, but subsequently we've seen a lot of experiments with form and attempts to be a bit more self-reflexive and self-aware, even bring in humor through a kind of yeah. meta-awareness. So I was wondering if you have experimented with form or thought of doing so, and to what extent does the humor uh, perhaps even rely on uh, these intertextual or meta sort of allusions to the form itself? Thank yeah, you. I, th I think I've accidentally experimented with form. Because as I say, I've, I've read so much crime fiction, it's, you know, it's, it's in my core. So I know how, what a crime fiction book looks like. But at the same time, I've got these characters who wouldn't fit into a traditional crime fiction book. The books are not traditional whodunits in, in a lot of ways. And I, 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 I only think, I don't really think of them as crime books. I think of them as books about the four characters. But in terms of the traditional whodunit and the golden age crime thing and the clues and what have you, the lovely thing about humor is we all read crime fiction. And the one thing we know in crime fiction is there's never a wasted sentence. If an author is saying something that seems slightly out of the ordinary, we know it's a clue. Or we know it's a red herring about a clue because the author also knows those rules. And so there's that lovely dance you have between author and reader of them saying, I know you're going to think this is a clue. Is it a clue? Is it not a clue? Have I cleverly hidden a clue in the next sentence because you're thinking so much about that previous clue? But the one thing I say about humor is the one place people, the, one so, the sort of sentences that don't seem out of place are jokes. If you do something that makes people laugh, they don't think, why is that in there? They're just laughing. And so I will quite often, don't go looking, I will quite often hide clues in jokes because I know it will, it, people will miss them. Because if we're laughing, we're already onto the next sentence, and we're not thinking about what was just said. So, so, so humour is very, very useful in, in that way. But no, I never think of the rules of crime fiction when I'm writing. I just think about my characters and, and the story they're telling. But of course, of course, we're influenced by every book we, we've ever read. It's, it, it's all up there somewhere, isn't it? Thanks. Um, uh, there was a gentleman there, yes. Uh, hi. Uh, on the one hand, your books are have this fun sense of British classic crime. On the other hand, they are full of very poignant moments and thoughts on mortality. So how do you approach writing about mortality? Again, it's, it, again in, in the same way I, I approach writing, you know, doing humor. I, I, I let the characters do all the heavy lifting for me. You know, when I started writing them, I get so many amazing advantages of writing about people who were in their 80s. As I say, the lack of consequences to what they do sometimes is funny. They have a lot of time on their hands. They're having to drink at 11 a.m. You know, so I get a lot of joy of writing about 80-year-olds. But if I do that, I have to pay the tax on that, which is we're not laughing if someone isn't true. If someone's just a superhero or a, or a, you know, a, a, a sort of larger-than-life character, we don't believe them. And if we don't believe them, we don't laugh at them. And if we don't believe them, we don't follow the plot. So I have to talk about what it is to get older. And I talk to lots of older people about it. And what it is to um, become infirm. What it is to, you know, dementia. All of these things, being around grief a lot. All of these things that come with, with being older. And if I want to tell a true story about being older, it can't be all rainbows and unicorns and isn't this lovely we're having a jolly time and solving murders i have to write the truth of their experience as well 
and it's, it's, it, I, I enjoy very much writing about grief and about dementia and about being able to put those um, issues in a, in, in a big mainstream book and, you know, to be able to have people speak about those things. So, yeah, it's, it's the tax. If, if, if I don't write the poignant stuff, I'm not allowed to write anything else, in my opinion. Um, I don't want to ignore people at the back. Uh, there's a hand right there at the back, the lady there. Hear the sounds. Uh, yeah. Keep your hand up, please. Yes, there you are. My question is, uh, when did you know, or more like, how did you know that the Thursday Murder Club needed a sequel? Like, yeah, it's 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 it's, it's very interesting. I was a, because I'm from the world of television. Is it my my whole career? The, the, the t TV industry is an industry of second series. If you get a first series of something, you're making no money. As soon as you get to a second series and a third series, and as soon as you start selling something abroad, that's where you make your money in TV. So, non-cynically, that's just, that's in my DNA. And I knew if I was going to start writing a book, then I'd want to write another one straight afterwards. You know, if you watch an episode of The Sopranos, you don't go, that's enough for me. Uh, you want to watch another episode and then an, another series. And, you know, I've, I'm enormously fortunate, because if you look at books, you know, look at uh, the wonderful Bonnie Garmus and Lessons in Chemistry, which is such a huge hit, but now she's got to follow it up with something different and the Eleanor Oliphant book, which was such a huge hit, and Paula Hawkins, they've got to follow up with something different. And I knew straight away that I wouldn't have to take four years thinking of something new. I knew I, knew I had these characters I loved and I could do it as a series. So right from the very beginning, I knew it was going to be a series, uh, unless the first one bombed, in which case it would have been a standalone. But uh, it, was, uh, it was always in, in my mind to, to make it a series. And I think detective fiction and crime fiction really lends itself to that as well. Um, yeah, the lady here, up in the, yeah. Hi, uh, I want to ask what kind of character you like, like being a murderer or being murdered or being an investigator, though I like being a murderer, but I don't want to caught at the end of the series or the book. Okay, so I think the question was, you like being a murderer, do I like being a murderer? <laughs> Is that right? I'm not uh, completely sure. Yeah, you I can interpret it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, I, I, you know, being a detective is my favourite thing. We all, we all love that, don't we? We all love kind of protecting people and, and what have you. So I love being a detective. And the act of reading crime fiction is is, is an act of detection. That's the that's the point of it, isn't it? You are you're trying to solve it. You're trying you're trying to help out. Um, yeah, I, I certainly think of the three options. Being murdered would be my third favourite. <laughs> Being a murderer would be my reluctant second favourite. Uh, and, given and the choices. Given the choices, yeah. If, if this is the game we're playing. And, uh, and yeah, and being, being the, the detective would, would be my number one. Right. Uh, just behind you. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Hi. Um, you mentioned uh, that Agatha Christie is one of your favourite crime writers. Who are some other classic and contemporary crime writers who are your favourite? I mean, it's, it's, it's such a wonderful stable of people. So, you know, everyone t talks about Agatha Christie, but she was around at the same time as Dorothy L. Sayers, who I think is Christie's equal, and, and in, in some books, um, uh, even better than Marjorie, Alli Marjorie Allingham and Josephine Tay, who are around at the same time. Um, so th th there's an incredible lineage of, uh, of, of British crime fiction, particularly. And even now, you've got, you know, Ian Rankin, who I think is wonderful. My favourite author who, who goes into crime fiction sometimes is Kate Atkinson. And I love Kate Atkinson's book so much. And, and when she started writing crime fiction, I was over the moon. Because I think, great, I get her wonderful prose. And there's a murder, uh, which for me is perfect. But uh, yeah, Mark Billingham, I love. Val McDermott, I love. Um, so yeah, there's, there's the lovely thing about crime fiction is you're never going to run out of, of authors to read. And now you have four more. Um, hand it over. Yeah. Richard, we love your books. We hope you keep writing. But I'm wondering if you think you have some other books in you. I, thought you, I thought you were going to stop after we love your books. <laughs> I thought it's more of a comment than a question. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a new book at the, at, at the moment, a non-Thursday murder club book, which I should be writing now, but I'm in Jaipur instead. Um, and it's still crime fiction. 
I, th I think when I made television, I made TV that I would like to watch. And when you write books, I think you have to write books that you would love to read because otherwise you're second guessing yourself. It's, you know, as you know, it's hard enough to write a book already if, unless it's something that you would like. And I, when I was writing the Thursday Murder Club books, I was, I was trying to look for a, a similar book, but that had a slightly more international scale, a bit more of a caper around the world, but that had that kind of British wit and humor. And I couldn't find one. So I thought, well, I'll write one. Uh, and that I think is the only way to write books is to go around your local bookshop and go, I, there's a book I, I can feel in my bones, the sort of book I want to read. And you look at each book, it goes, oh, it's not quite that, it's not quite that. And if you ever have that sensation, then go home and write the book that you just thought of because no one else has written it. And that's, uh, that, that's how I felt about the new one. Yeah, I don't think... I, I read a lot of literary fiction and I read, I'm reading Middlemarch at the moment, which I know I should have read many years before. But, you know, you have to be honest with yourself. I'm not going to be able to write Middlemarch. You know, if, I, if in 10 years' time I've got so grand, I come back here and I say, yes, I've written a multi-generational epic about, you know, five generations of a British family. And a, like, honestly, don't invite me. <laughs> because, you know, I think, I, I think I'm okay at writing crime fiction. But uh, outside of that, there, there, there are other people I'd rather read than me. Richard, and I have a question before I hand it over. I mean, we hear of this British humor. We know what it is, and we, you know, we kind of intrinsically understand. But if I ask you just a simple question, what is British humor? What is it? Gosh, that's a good question. I mean, it's, it's, it's impossible to say. It's like, what, what, is, what is an Indian sky? It's the thing that's always around you, isn't it? Uh, and so you, it's, it's, it, it's impossible to define. I mean, it's certainly... The thing with English people is they always mean the exact opposite of what they're saying and which is either because they're being polite or because they're being funny uh, and so that's the key in, in any in any interaction with any English person you ever meet whatever they've just said is the opposite of what they mean to say and yeah, if you, if you, you go know, we have been taught that in our history books when, you, when the first Englishman came said we were here for a very short while yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You see, that was funny. Yeah, and I, yeah, I, ironically, that's very English humor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, yes, we're still laughing. Yeah. I'm so. I listen. I apologize. <laughs> it was a setup. Yeah, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a good one. Yeah, but listen, I'm 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 glad to come from a country that has at least people around the world don't like Brits for much anymore. But one of the things they still love us for is our humour, and it's lovely to be able to uh, export that and to show sort of some of our some of our good sides from time to time. <laughs> uh, I'll take the next. Uh, there's a lady out there. Yeah, hands up there. Yep. Hi, Richard. So you know, when you build out these stories and you've been introducing characters at different times. Do you already know where they're going to go in like book three and four? When do you think about when am I going to introduce this? And I don't want to get spoilers, but you know, in the latest book, there's spoilers. So when do you think about when this is going to come up? And do you already know when you write those characters? I don't really. I know that's, that's a sort of J.K. Rowling way of doing stuff, having a whole universe planned out. I think I would get bored if I, if, if I did that. So what, what I try and do, I'm, I'm only ever thinking five scenes ahead, really, or five chapters ahead. And... I tend to, characters will come into stories, and I try and make all the new characters as interesting as possible. They'll come into stories, they will say a single thing, and I'll think, oh, that's interesting. Why would you say that? And let that help develop my plot. There's a character called Bogdan, who's in all the books, who I absolutely love. Uh, yeah. Uh, and he's, uh, he's, he's, he's such a joy to write. But he was originally only in one scene. I had the bad guy in the first book, and I wanted him to... Uh, I wanted to underpay his builder, and that was Bogdan. Bogdan said one line, and I thought, oh, you're going to stick around. And he stuck around for four books. So I like to surprise myself. Folks, that's all we have time for. Richard, thank you so much. Oh, thank that you. was wonderful. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.